welcome. Uh, I'm glad you found this place. It's a little bit out of the way, and if you notice some great big people coming up on the elevator with you, uh, this is the study hall for the athletic department, and some of those people, some of them were our offensive line. <laughs> that average is over 300 pounds. So, um, I'm Bob Newton. I'm special assistant to the president of Boston College, Father Leahy, and uh, I'm the interim director of the Church in the 21st Century Center. Um, just a word about the center. started eight years ago uh, in the midst of the clerical sexual abuse crisis here in Boston as uh, BC's effort to uh, be responsive to the needs of the Catholic community, not only here, but uh, nationwide and, and really internationally uh, in the midst of this crisis. We have four focal issues, handing on the faith, the roles and relationships of people in the church, which uh, clearly is, uh, this presentation is uh, on that focal issue, the Catholic intellectual tradition and sexuality in the Catholic tradition. Uh, this year we focused on the concept of grace and commitment and the concept of vocation and we started off in the first semester with an issue of c21 resources which i hope you all have received or will pick up one if you haven't that focused on the vocations of the laity uh, the, the second semester we focused on the vocations of religious and the ordained of uh, bishops priests, deacons, and the various uh, religious orders. Uh, I'm happy to, um, my role tonight is to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker. <laughs> and uh, I'd, I'd like to also point out uh, that he was the guest editor who produced this, uh, this volume of C21 resources on the vocations of religious and the ordained. Uh, he's Father Richard Lanan, uh, a diocesan priest from Australia who joined the Western Jesuit faculty uh, probably four or five years ago, uh, and who's currently the, the chairman of the Western Jesuit department in our new School of Theology and Ministry. So I'd like to thank him. He did a terrific, he did a terrific job for us in producing this. We, we have a tremendous amount of interest in it. and. Uh, so we're grateful to him not only for that guest editorship, but for being here tonight to introduce our guest speaker. I'd like to add my words of welcome to what, what Bob has already said. I have a uh, not only a pleasurable job, but a very easy one because the, the relevant <laughs> details are all there in front of you. But in, in the process, I, I just wanted to say something about the, the latest edition of C21 Resources. In, in looking at the, the three ordained ministries in the church and in religious life, we tried to cover a, a range of perspectives. So we, we tried for each of those areas to give something from the church's teaching, Vatican II documents, contemporary papal documents, documents of the American bishops, and then a theological analysis of the particular ministry that we're dealing with, and thirdly, some personal perspectives, so what people think the contemporary issues are or the contemporary struggles. In the context of the diaconate, what we did was take some of the norms from the American bishops on the guidelines on formation, which Bill has probably had a role in formulating. We have a statement from Cardinal Walter Casper, who's written extensively on all of the church's ordained ministry, but so looking particularly at the diaconate and its theology and the questions around it. We took some of the, the statistical details from CARA, the Centre for the Applied uh, Research in the Apostolate from Georgetown University, on the state of the diaconate in the US church. How many are there? What do they do? Where do they work? And so on. And the final thing, which perhaps it might seem a little quirky, but we were happy, and in fact, almost excited to do, was a perspective from the wife of a deacon uh, and, and what her experiences of diaconate and the questions that it raises for her. So we hope that those things, as well as the ones on ordained priesthood and bishops and religious, make this a, an issue that uh, is both 
encouraging and challenging and stimulating. So if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to see it, as Bob said, there are plenty of copies available as you leave, and I'd really encourage that too, um, to your reading. So that's the commercial. Now to the substance, and that is to introduce uh, De Deacon uh, Bill Dightweed to you. Bill comes to us particularly uh, from his role working with the bishops in the guidance, overall guidance of the diaconate program for the church in this country. But beyond that, he has an extensive personal background of service in the Navy, of academic study, of teaching presently at a university, and is about to move to the Diocese of Monterey to take over uh, their pastoral development and program. So it's, it's our, we're very fortunate to have Bill with us tonight. Thank you all for being with us, and I invite you to welcome Bill as he talks to us on Wither the Diaconate. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, an unbelievable honor for me to be here. I've, I've followed the center since its inception. Uh, and in fact, when I uh, got the email inviting me, at first I thought it was just, just a normal thing from the center. And I read it closer and said, would you come and do this? And I, I, I couldn't believe it was, uh, it was happening. Um, thank you for the gracious introductions. And the question I was given was, whither the diaconate? And the first thing that went through my perverted little mind was whither or whither? Uh, is the diaconate going to blossom or is the diaconate going to fade on the vine? Uh, I have some comments I'd like to make. I hope that they will be brief, as brief as I can make them. Uh, as was indicated, I've been working at this now for quite some time. I've been a deacon myself now for 21 years this month, uh, a deacon of the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. Uh, so there's a lot, to, a lot to say and a lot to do. My hope tonight is to talk about a number of things, a lot of myths and misperceptions that people have about the Um I, I told Karen earlier this afternoon that I was so happy on the, the resources uh, volume that it talks about the ministries of the religious and the ordained. Normally, when a deacon picks up a book entitled like that, you look in vain for something about the diaconate because the paradigm still operating very often in people's minds and popular imagination is religious and priests. Even though the term ordained, as we all know, is much more inclusive now and much more diverse now. Uh, and so I was very happy to see that. But there are still a lot of myths out there. The other thing that I wanted to say is I've subtitled this Vectors of Renewal. One of the things that I learned as a young Navy officer years ago is that when you were plotting a course, you needed to be concerned with vectors, not just what direction you were going to put your ship on, but how you put, apply the force and the speed to get there. Uh, your car can be pointed in the right direction in the morning, but you're not going to go anywhere if you don't apply some force, some, some energy to, to the effort. And so I think that's, that's an important thing here. Not only is where the diaconate going, but how are we going to get there? What, where do we need to put some energy to, uh, to make those things happen? So there's basically five things I want to cover quick, somewhat quickly. Uh, first, who are deacons? What are some lessons from history? We talk about any of you who are historians, this will be probably the quickest historical review you've ever heard. Uh, but there are some points that need to be made from the history. Vatican II and the diaconate, again, uh, many, many myths and misperceptions about why Vatican II did what it did, and most of them are wrong, and we'll talk about that. Uh, I am going to visit some of the statistics that are in the uh, document already, uh, but I want to kind of go over a couple of those because uh, one in particular is quite disturbing, uh, and I want to uh, spend some time with that. And then finally, a look to the future. What might we do? How might things look as we move uh, further into the future? So those are some areas I want to hit. Oh, how fancy. Now, I want to give you an assignment, a little quiz as we start. I want you to just ask yourself to think of a deacon you know, and I know there are some deacons in the audience, so think of yourselves. How much time does that deacon spend in the ministry? Just think about that. 
one of the things I hear from pastors, well, I like deacons, but you know, they're part-time. You know, they're only here a few hours a week, and you know, I could really use them more, but they're part-time. That's one of the biggest mistakes people make. Because just like when priests are ordained or bishops are ordained, once you are ordained, you are ordained for all of it, for all time. So the answer here is 24-7, 365. When that deacon, who might be selling used cars for a living, is selling those used cars, he's doing it as a deacon. If he's a teacher, he's a deacon. If he's a naval officer, he's a deacon. And he's ministering. Maybe not in a traditional way that we think of ministry. Maybe you don't give him an office at the church, at the parish. But is that the only place we do ministry? Is that where we're supposed to do ministry? Not for the deacon. So again, we tend to jump right into this functional thing about the deacons. Well, he's a part-time minister. John Paul II was very eloquent in several of his writings where he kept saying, this is not about being a job. This is a vocation, it is a ministry, and it's full-time, no matter where you are. So, here's a some more little questions on our quiz. True or false, Vatican II restored the diaconate. Any of you happen to have read any of my books, you already know the answer to this one. No, the answer is false. Most of us who write about the diaconate today are concerned about that word restore. If I say something is restored, it can be taken incorrectly as meaning that we had something, it stopped, and now it's been started up again. The church, on the other hand, has never been without deacons, ever. How that ministry has been exercised over the many centuries has varied. So most of us today prefer to speak a language of renewal. And if anything was restored in the renewal of the diaconate, it is the permanence of the diaconate, that someone can exercise this ministry permanently without intending to proceed to ordination as a presbyter. The second question, the diaconate was pushed primarily by bishops from the so-called third world or mission territories. We hear this from everybody, and it's flat wrong. As you'll see from some of the history, the Germans started talking about this in 1840. And in Germany, France, Italy, and other parts of the world, but primarily there, these conversations went on through the rest of the 1800s and into the 20th century. Did bishops from the mission countries jump on the bandwagon? Yes, just before the council started, because they were hearing from their German brothers about their desire to renew a diaconate. And so the mission bishops, one of whom, by the way, was named Willem van Beckham from the Netherlands, who was serving in Indonesia, but he was aware of the German literature, and he said maybe those kinds of ministers could help us in Indonesia as well. So they kind of came late to the party and then did support it. But the original initiative comes from Europe. Deacons aren't needed since lay people can do anything a deacon can do. Now, we know that that's a problematic question. Change the, change the uh, subject and to say that that's a priest. Priests aren't needed because lay people can do everything a priest can do. Now, ah, see where we're getting into some difficulty here. Priests have certain powers of ordination. They have the power to say mass, the power to hear confessions. Deacons don't have powers like that. But still, we know if you change that subject and say priests aren't needed since lay people can do anything a deacon can do, what's the focus of the question? The focus of the question is on function. And in Catholic sacramental theology, as we know, the focus is on first on essence. Who are we? And the functions are to flow from that. Believe it or not, I've been some places, by the way, all of these I've heard multiple times traveling around. Uh, we, don't, we have enough priests, we don't need deacons. Now, believe it or not, there's still places that say that. Um, that's good, except that we're not ordained to fill in for a shortage of priests. 
Uh, I was once, when I was at, in Washington at the Bishop's Conference, I got a, a call one day from a wonderful lady who called and said, oh, Deacon, thank you for taking my call. She said, I just wanted somebody there at the Bishop's Conference to realize how much we love our deacons and how much we appreciate what you all do. And I said, well, thank you, ma'am. I'll find a way to communicate that. And, and she said, oh, Deacon, isn't it terrible, all the troubles in the church today? And I said, yes, ma'am, it certainly is. And she said, won't it be wonderful when all those troubles are gone? Yes, ma'am, it will be. And then we won't need you guys. <laughs> her whole sense of lay ministry in the church and her whole sense of diaconate in church was that we were there as a stopgap. And that once things got better, we wouldn't be needed anymore and things could go back to where Father did it all. Um, this one I heard as recently as two months ago uh, from a priest a friend of mine who told me, yes, Bill, but you know, your diaconate isn't a real vocation, like being a priest or a member of, the, of a religious congregation. It's not a real vocation. And I said, well, what was that, what was that ceremony that I went through? <laughs> Cardinal Hickey thought it was a real something. I said, what was that ordination thing all about? He goes, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an ordination, but it's not a real vocation. I said, your real vocation is marriage. I said, so what's diaconate? A hobby? He said, well, well no. And I said, what about deacons who aren't married? What about deacons who are not married? What's their vocation? Again, what's happening with the renewed diaconate is that the paradigm for ordained ministry has been shattered. The trouble is, as I see it today, is that our popular imagination, our cultural imagination is still catching up. Most of us grew up watching Bing Crosby and Going My Way, and that image of clergy meaning priest and laity or religious, those were the options. Well, now it's different. The game has changed. So who are deacons? Deacon is an ordained minister of the Catholic Church. We're ordained to serve as a sacramental sign to the church and to the world of Christ who came to serve and not to be served. That's what we're supposed to be a sign of. Who are, who are we not? Deacons are, in terms of canon law, no longer members of the lay state. And yet, deacons are not priests. But for at least 800 years, ordination was almost exclusively understood as priestly. But with Vatican II and Paul VI, that paradigm was shattered. I took this out of an old uh, seminary textbook. There's the Sacrament of Holy Orders until the year 1972 when Pope Paul VI changed it. But I would like to uh, point something out here. Tonsure was not an ordination. It was simply a liturgical rite by which a man became a member of the clergy. So you could be clergy and not be ordained anything. Then you had the four minor orders, porter, lector, exorcist, and acolyte. At the Second Vatican Council, several of the bishops said they wanted all of these orders to become permanent. I always thought it would be nice to be a permanent exorcist. <laughs> Go to hell. <laughs> but these were ordinations, but they were not sacramental. They didn't confer a character. How do we know that? You see a stole? Then we get to the major orders of subdeacon, deacon, and priest. Subdeacon, a major order of ministry. Notice the change in clothing, but still no stole given to a subdeacon. So no sacramental effect. The full sacrament of holy orders, or the, full, uh, the beginnings of it, lie with the deacon, who receives a stole as a sign of, of that sacramental character, and then the priesthood. But now, notice as well, it all ends with the priesthood. Canon law, the Code of Canon Law of 1917, which would have been in effect at the Second Vatican Council, told bishops that they could not knowingly ordain a man to any order if they did not have a reasonable expectation that they would be ordaining that man to the priesthood eventually. So a man could not go up to a bishop and say, I don't think I have a vocation to the priesthood, but I do think I have a vocation to be a deacon. The bishop could not ordain him to anything, because everything found its end in the priesthood. 
As I say, this all ended in 1972 with the document Ministeria Quaidam, uh, published by Paul VI, where he redid the, the context of holy orders. So the theological shift that takes place with this then is this. That former system, which we call the cursus honorum, the course of honors, the diaconate was seen and defined as a part of the ministerial priesthood. But after 1972, and especially after the appearance and the changes made to this paragraph in 1997 of the Catechism, and then with the motu proprio omnium in mentem in 2009, that has changed. And now deacons are correctly, in my opinion, said to not participate in the ministerial priesthood. But what does that mean? It means we are ordained, it's sacramental, has a permanent effect, and yet not unto priesthood. So now that, what does, what, the implications of this are profound. Because before, what you could say about priesthood, you could probably try to find a way to say something similar or analogous about deacons. That's becoming more and more problematic. Some lessons from history. I want to just give you two or three quotes here from the patristics, and again, this is embarrassingly brief, but there's several points I want you to, to notice. First of all is the association of the ministry of the deacon with the ministry of Christ. Again, in our generations, we've become very, very common to hear of the, priest, of the priesthood being associated with the ministry of Christ. But in the patristics, it was the deacon associated with the ministry of Christ. The second association is that of the deacon with the bishop. Time and time and time again. And lastly, the diversity of function. Um, when I started this, I had many more slides and you would see the diversity of function even more. I'll probably just allude to a few of them. Ignatius of Antioch, of course, one of the, one of the famous quotations about here. But let me just show you a few of these. Notice, I like the bit about everyone must show deacons respect. That's kind of nice to hear. They represent Jesus Christ. Just as the bishop has the role of the father and the presbyters are like God's counsel in an apostolic band. That's how Ignatius understood this. Let the deacons, my special favorites, be entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ, who was with the father from eternity and appeared at the end of the world. Hippolytus, about 215. And I'm sure you're all aware, when a deacon is ordained, even today, only the ordaining bishop lays hands on the deacon. Unlike a priesthood ordination, where all of the attending priests lay hands, or a bishop's ordination, where all of the, all of the bishops present lay hands on the newly ordained, with a deacon, only the bishop lays hands on the deacon. And this goes all the way back to the beginning. So when the deacon is ordained, this is the reason why the bishop alone shall lay his hands upon him. He is not ordained to the priesthood, but to serve the bishop and to carry out the bishop's commands. He does not receive that spirit that is possessed by the priesthood in which the priests share. He receives only what is confided in him under the bishop's authority. Now what's interesting is that about 220 years later, this language is going to be slightly changed. And it's the language we read in Lumen Gentium 29. The language is going to say, the deacon is not ordained to the priesthood, but to ministry. Episcopy is taken off. To the bishop is taken off. Why? Because what was happening was that cursus honorum had begun to set in. And more and more deacons were now being assigned to assist priests. Where before the deacons had almost exclusively been with bishops. And so the reference to the bishop is taken off. The trouble for us is you're, you wind up with this terribly imprecise word of ministerium, service. What's that mean? Here it's very specific. I'm ordained to serve the bishop. End of story. Bishop tells me to change his tire, I change his tire. You know, I, so this has caused us problems ever since. Because how do you define service? I like Cyprian. Now, he's a bishop. He's in, writing from exile. And this is just to show you a little bit of the diversity of function. So he's sitting up in the hills. He gets complaints from his people, and he writes a letter down to them. If they should be seized with any misfortune and peril of sickness, they should, without waiting for me, 
before any presbyter who might be present, or if a presbyter should not be found and death begins to be imminent, etiam diaconus, before even a deacon, be able to make confession of their sin that with the imposition of hands upon them for repentance, they should come to the Lord with the peace which the martyrs have desired by their letters to us to be granted to them. Now, am I saying deacons heard confessions all over the world? No. But clearly, this bishop was authorizing it. And by the way, most deacons I know don't want to hear confessions. But I just, I just show you the diversity here. Fabian of Rome divided, the Ro divided Rome into seven deaconries. This is the time frame of the legend of Lawrence. And of course, the famous deacon of Rome, Lawrence, embodies so much of what the diaconate is about. He has a wicked sense of humor, and every deacon I've ever known has a wicked sense of humor. But also, notice the story. Think of the legend. He's, a, he's arrested with the other deacons and subdeacons and the bishop of Rome. They're thrown in jail. The magistrate realizes that he has the archdeacon of Rome in his grasp. He doesn't release the pope. He doesn't release anybody else. He, release, he releases the chief deacon. The chief deacon is released in order to bring him the wealth of the church. So what's the association? The association is the deacon knows where the money is. The deacon is responsible for the temporalities of the church. What does Lawrence do? He rounds up the poor of the city of Rome and the next morning shows up at the magistrate's courtyard escorting the poor of Rome and says, here's the treasure of the church. And he's immediately taken in and martyred on a gridiron. And supposedly he turns to his, his, his uh, executioner and says, I'm done on this side, you can turn me over. But notice the, the association of him with the temporalities, with the money, but also the association with the poor. There's the Didascalia Apostolorum from Syria uh, is just a beautiful document. I'm not going to read this all to you, but I want you to just notice the relationship here between the deacon and the bishop. Be of one mind. Shepherd the people diligently with one accord, for you ought to be one body, father and son, for you are in the likeness of the Lord. Let the deacon be the hearing of the bishop, his mouth, his heart, his soul, for when you are both of one mind through your agreement, there will be peace in the church. Look at this one. Look at especially at the end. And be you bishop and deacon of one council and of one purpose and one soul dwelling in two bodies. This relationship of the bishop to the deacon just comes through almost every document. The same document echoes Ignatius. The bishop sits for you in the place of God Almighty. The deacon stands in the place of Christ and you love him. If then our Lord did this, will you, O deacons, hesitate to do the like for them that are sick and infirm, you are, who are workmen of the truth and bear the likeness of Christ? As I said, that was an embarrassing review of that history, but those points continue to be essential to us. The relationship of the deacon to the bishop, the diversity of function, and the association of the deacon with the ministry of Christ. Now, Vatican II and the diaconate. Uh, one of my former students is here, will tell you, we teach semester-long courses on some of this stuff. And I'm just going to cut to the chase. How would 2,640 bishops from around the world, gathering in 1962 in Rome, even think of renewing the a diaconate permanent? Not one of them would ever have known a permanent deacon. Now, when's the last time you went to a meeting and somebody said, we've got a whole series of problems. I know. Let's bring back something we haven't done in a thousand years. That'll answer it. That'll fix it. I don't think so. Something was on their minds, and somehow the bishops of the world knew about this potential. As far as I can tell, we can go back to about 1840, where a German doctor writes to a priest friend of his. And he's talking about ecclesial reform. He says the, the people have become too divorced from the church herself, from the institution itself. And we need to find ways to reconnect people. One way to do it would be to expand the role of the deacon, to give him a mission from the bishop, 
to preach the good news to the very people with whom he lives. Not bad. That's not a bad theology of diaconate either. There was strong Protestant influence in Germany, which really focused on the care of the poor and the needy, and that influenced the Catholic Church as well. The development of caritas in Germany, so that by the end of the 1800s, the German bishops mandated that every German diocese have a caritas organization, much like our Catholic charities. You put two Germans in a room, they're going to have a journal. And so they start writing about what does charity mean? What does pastoral care of the poor mean? And maybe it would be nice if some among us were ordained as servants to sacramentalize that to which we are all called by our baptism. Then we get into the 20th century. Now just think about all the stuff that goes on in the 20th century. Two world wars, worldwide economic collapse, the formation of three totalitarian governments. And imagine if you were born in 1900. And imagine at 62 you're a, a German bishop going into the Second Vatican Council. This is your life. Teenager, World War I. Communist revolution when you're 17. Fascism. The Spanish Civil War, worldwide economic collapse while you're trying to earn a living, while you're trying to go to the seminary. And then in 1933, this guy shows up on the scene. Caritas begins to respond because what is Hitler doing? Hitler's taking all of the social institutions of Germany and he's bringing them under the control of the government. So it's no longer the Reichsbank or the Deutsches Bank, it's the Reichsbank. And so they were beginning to say, well, what if they turn this into the Reich's Caritas? We need to somehow try to find a way to maintain our autonomy. Part of that would be helped if we had people who were officially designated by the church to be doing these kind of things. We call those people deacons. The next director of Caritas kind of says the same thing, and he gets even more specific. He said, yes, the beauty of a deacon is he would have a mission from the bishop to connect the ministries of worship, witness, and charity. He would be a minister of connect the dots to the people around him. This is how we worship, this is how we witness, and this is how we care for one another. And all of the, look at the years, all of this is while Hitler is expanding his power. The first concentration camp is opened in 1933 at Dachau, outside of Munich. Not only to become the incubator of renewal, it was also the training ground for the SS. And it's also the privileged camp to receive clergy of all faiths. Before the end of the war, over 3,000 priests would be incarcerated in Dachau alone. One of the first orders that the commandant received from Berlin was that he was not to give clergy of any faith any special treatment. That clergy in Germany had been living a life of privilege for all these years, and that now was the time for them to just be housed with everybody else. Well, what do you think you have in a cell block if among the regular prisoners you also have a Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Uh, you have Protestant ministers, you have Catholic priests, you might even have the occasional Catholic bishop. Uh, you have rabbis. What do you have in that cell block? You have church. You have synagogue. Because none of those ministers are going to stop ministering. The original purpose of Dachau was to break people, not to kill them. It was to break them and convert them into good little Nazis and then be released back into the culture. But these people were being sped, fed spiritually. And so they didn't break as fast as the Germans wanted. They eventually caught on, cleared out a couple of cell blocks, and threw all the priests in one of them. Eventually, they would fill almost three cell blocks. The guards referred to it as the priester block. But now, as we would say in the Navy, you've got a think tank. Because now, not only are these men still smuggling themselves out to minister to people and risking their lives to minister to people, now they have time to talk together. 
And they're asking themselves the same kind of questions that I just proposed to you. If you were a German priest in 1945, just before liberation, you've got to be sitting here and asking yourself, where was the church? Why weren't we a more effective witness to stop all of this? And what does the church have to do in the future to be a more effective witness of Christ in the world? After the war is over, these survivors, especially two Jesuit priests, Otto Peace, who was sort of the senior priest in the camp, did a lot of the coordination of things there, and Wilhelm Schimoni, began to write, and write extensively about the conversations they held in the Priesterblock. And among the many items of renewal that they wanted to talk about, one of them was this renewed diaconate. Now again, remember in Germany, they'd been talking about deacons for 100 years. And now they saw specifically, what have we learned here at the camp? We've learned it doesn't matter if I'm wearing my clerical clothes or if I have fancy vestments to wear. It doesn't matter if I have a historic cathedral to say mass in. What matters here is do I have the guts and the courage to crawl through the mud and the gore to go minister to some person who just saw the rest of her family taken to the ovens? Do I have the courage and the heart to do that? And as they began to reflect on this, they said, what a marvelous opportunity this is, because the church has that kind of sacramental sign. We haven't been using it. The sacramental sign of Christ, the suffering servant, in concert with the sign of Christ the priest. My friend and mentor at Catholic U, likes to, Joe Kamanchak, used to say it this way. Vatican II didn't restore the diaconate as a permanent state because of a shortage of priests, but because of a shortage of deacons. And this is what these men are reflecting. Well, after these guys begin to write, a young man in Freiburg, Germany, begins to form a deacon circle because he feels called to be a deacon. And this becomes the first of dozens of deacon circles around Europe. Happens to be a friend of a guy some of us have read over the years, Karl Rahner, who went to visit his friend Hannes and was taken by the idea of a diaconate. His first article on the diaconate appears in 1947. The first mention of deacons in the international or in the mission territories comes in 1956 at Assisi when Bishop von Beckham makes his note about Indonesia. Pius XII weighs in just before he dies, and he says, oh, I think the idea of a permanent diaconate is wonderful. I don't think the time is ripe yet. But when it is, when deacons do return, they'll take their rightful place among the clergy of the church. Just before the council opens, I refer to this as the forgotten Rahner. Karl Rahner writes a 536-page book in German on the diaconate and its renewal. It's never been published in English ever. We're working on the first full English language translation of it now. But he got a copy to every bishop before the council started. So every bishop who could read German had the results of his research. When the pope called the council, he sent a letter out to all the bishops and said, tell me what you want to talk about. Of the nearly 9,000 proposals for the agenda at Vatican II, 101 of them concerned the diaconate and they represented multiple bishops from around the world. And of those 101, only 11 were against the idea. Now, as I said, being a deacon is about more than, oh my Lord, I'm going so far over, uh, is more, about, more than about function. But here's what some of the bishops thought before the council deacons might do. First of all, notice the age. The deacon, married deacons could, be, could exist, this was stunning in the Latin church, but they would have to be of a mature age of 40. We'll see what happens to that later. Specific functions that are highlighted by the bishops, these 71 bishops. He should be an experienced catechist, and here using the word catechist in the international connotation, of more of a pastoral associate, not only someone who teaches religious ed. Should be an experienced person in parish administration. Recent surveys show that deacons dislike parish administration as much as priests dislike parish administration. Administration of church goods and property. Where's the social justice stuff here? 
Thought deacons were supposed to be social justice focused. Ooh, official preaching and teaching. Here's one that'll get you. Presiding at extreme unction and other sacramental ministries. The vision here is of an experienced lay minister. This is not somebody who woke up one day and said, well, I've kind of done everything else. I think I'll be a deacon now. This was somebody who's already known within the community as a servant leader, who is now going to receive the sacramental grace of ordination as a deacon. Cardinal Suenens had a lot to do with this. He got up and actually articulated the theology of the diaconate. He also did a few political things very well. One is he told the bishops who didn't want deacons to say, well, that's okay, you don't want them. But you've heard from many bishops here who do, they should be able to have deacons if they want them. Bishops like that kind of thinking. And so I might vote for it even though I don't intend to bring it into my diocese. I'm voting for it so that you can bring it into yours. The bishops started to debate this age thing and 40 was seen as just way too old. They envisioned a diaconate of younger married men, well, younger men, including married men. And again, Suenens provides a theological reflection. If we had more time, I'd go into it. It's very much based on the nature of grace and the, the graces given to the church. The last speech at the council was given by Pope Paul VI, who summarized the work of the council. Now, this is December 7th, the day before the, the formal closing of the council. But notice how the Pope summarizes the work of the four years of the council. We stress that everything has been channeled into the notion of service. The church has declared herself to be a servant. And we've done many things here, but the idea of service has been central. Now, this is important because look what happens later. When he restores the permanent diaconate, he goes back to that notion of the church being a deacon, the church being servant. He says the permanent diaconate is the driving force, the animator, the agitator, sometimes he uses, the agitator of the church's service. In other words, as deacons, we only make sense within a diaconal church. We are deacons within a diaconate church. John Paul II, after quoting Pope Paul, went on to say that the service of the deacon is the church's service sacramentalized. So points from the council. Deacons were seen as being needed not to fill in for a shortage of priests. Think about the logic of that, by the way. If the church needs priests, if a bishop went to the council saying, I need priests, so I want deacons, what sense is that? It makes no logical sense whatsoever. I need priests, so I'll take deacons? No, no. The church is seen as deacon. The radical sacramentality of the deacon, that the deacon is graced by sacramental grace through his ordination. This is not some kind of certification or authorization, it's an ordination. They foresaw a youthful presence of deacon. People still engaged in the world, still raising families, still working. Why? Because that would extend the reach of the church. It would be the church's official ministers in the world. The relationship to the bishop. The debate on the diaconate at the Second Vatican Council took place literally within the debate on the nature of the bishops themselves. They saw the diaconate as part of, as sharing in their own ministry. And it restored the permanency of this. They had to change the law. Pope Paul would have to actually change the law to permit bishops to ordain a man to the diaconate and not intend to ordain him to the priesthood. This is a quote I mentioned before from John Paul II. Now here, as a young bishop at the council, here's what he remembered. That the need behind the decision was that of a greater and more direct presence of the church's sacred ministers in areas such as family, work, schools, and so forth. So just because the deacon isn't at the parish, he's still ministering. He's still a deacon. He's still an official presence of the church and a representative of the bishop. Some statistics and issues. We'll go through these really quickly. Here, the current state of the diaconate numerically is very healthy. We keep on the rise 
And this changes. US only. This is the US only. Yeah. Worldwide, we're at about 37,000. And that ratio where we have roughly half of the world's deacons is, has been that way for about 15 years. Part of it is we have 196 dioceses. Germany has 22. So just looking at raw numbers doesn't tell the tale. Ministerial data, this is changing rapidly. Notice 82% of us report serving on active ministry up dramatically from about three years ago. That, the, where it says 13 retired from ministry, up until about three years ago, that was down like about four. And you're gonna see why here in a minute. Well, not because of this one. 92% of our deacons are married. 92%. It's important to remember that this is not, even though that numbers are that high, this is not a married ministry per se. I had a call one time in Washington from a guy calling saying, I think the Lord's calling me to be a deacon, but I, I can't. And I said, why not? He said, I'm not married. He thought that a prerequisite to become a deacon was that you had to be married. Um, again, we have to be careful. We have many, many single, permanent deacons serving in the, in the world today. They're still open to marriage. Not after they're ordained. So a, a single deacon has to be celibate. A single deacon has to be celibate, yes. Race and ethnicity. Largely a white group. Now, but again, this changes almost diocese by diocese. In my home diocese, Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., the numbers look nothing like this. There are much higher in African-American deacons in Washington. But this is the national average. Education, by and large, very well educated group. And this is prior to formation. And again, I would refer you to the uh, C21 resources for more of this. But here's the one I wanted to get to. The age of deacons. Remember that vision of Vatican II? 24% of our deacons are 70 or older. A quarter of our deacons are over 70. Add in the 37% who are between 60 and 69, and we got an issue. The average age of a deacon everywhere else in the world is 44. They're just as married as we are, they have just as many kids as we do, and they work just as hard as we do. But somehow in the United States, the message has gotten out that somehow this is a second career vocation. But remember the history of the Germans. Remember the history from Europe. They've been talking about this for a long time. We didn't have the benefit of that discussion in the United States. And so diaconates developed a bit differently here than it has in other parts of the world. But this is a major concern. Notice about 30% of our deacons are now paid for their ministry. Now, this is not the, the average parish deacon getting paid. This is somebody who's working for a diocese. This is someone who's doing some kind of, maybe principal of a Catholic school, that kind of thing. But a third of our deacons, and I keep that ratio in mind, or that number in mind, but a third of our deacons are paid. How many deacons still hold a secular job? Only 38%. So what happened to that forward reach, the tip of the spear of the deacon out there in the world? Well, no, 62. Well, do some of the math. I'm a theologian, not a mathematician, but you add another 30 so percent here of the people who are working full time for the church and getting paid for it, the rest of the guys are retired. This is another part of the concern, the average age at ordination. In the 70s, 46. Look how it's gone up increasingly since. Kara hasn't tested this in a while. We need to ask him to do it again. But again, if somebody was ordained in 1972, at 46, they have a long time to serve, 30 years. But if I'm only 53 when I'm ordained, when I was ordained in 1990, I was 40. I was the youngest guy in my class by five years. Nobody knows, except people are deferring it. A lot of times people will say, well, you still have young kids at home. So, uh, you're, you might get moved by your job. So? The same is true of priesthood. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah. No. 
So a lot of it, I think, we, we self-deselect in some of this. Deacon, I think I'm called, to be a de I'm called to be a deacon. Really? Good. Well, wait a few years, though, because your kids are still little. I went through formation. All four of our kids were real little, and it was the best time we ever had. Um, anyway. Was it, it wasn't that high. I have no idea. The data doesn't tell us. So challenges and tensions from the data. And I want to wrap things up here. First of all, there's never been a really good theology of the diaconate. Why? There never was a need for one. Up until Vatican II, a theology of the diaconate would have been a theology of the priesthood. Deacons were simply priests in training. Sometimes we still get referred to as many priests or super laity. There's really been, until recently, a, a development of a theology of the diaconate. And we've been trying over the last 10 or 15 years to speak to that. The aging of the U.S. diaconate. That is a great matter of concern. The fact that many of our, of our deacons are so parish-centered. Remember that relationship with the bishop? The whole point of the deacon was to extend the reach of the bishop. Now, if the bishop assigns me to a parish, which he should, every deacon should have a parish base, but my focus can't be just on the parish. That's father's job. The pastor is responsible to pastor the parish. The deacon is there to help father the best he can, but also to keep his eyes focused on issues that transcend the parish because he's still the eyes and the ears and the heart and the soul of the bishop. That's led many dioceses now to have a dual assignment for deacons, one to a parish and one to something beyond the parish. This is a big issue coming up here, with so many deacons entering full-time employment. Again, if, if the deacon is ordained and assigned by the bishop and then father hires him to be the whatever in the parish, what does that look like? It looks like father has hired the deacon. Well, what happens if he wants to fire the deacon? The deacon looks like a parish employee when he is not. And there are horror stories of this happening around the country. Let's wrap this up so we can get into some discussion. Seeing the diaconate anew. In my opinion, the first and foremost task is we have to help people develop a sense, a conciliar view. The Second Vatican Council is still operative, still active, still influential. And we have to understand what the council had to say about the nature of the church. And once we are into that context, then and only then can we understand the nature of the diaconate within the church. Deacons are not supposed to do what others are supposed to be doing. Okay, that's a strange way to put this, but here's the way the Congregation for Clergy says it. This is in their, their directory for the diaconate. In every case, it is important that deacons fully exercise their ministry. In preaching, in liturgy, in charity, they should not be relegated to marginal duties, be made merely to act as substitutes, nor discharge duties normally entrusted to non-ordained members of the faith. Now think about that with every deacon we know and how he gets used in a parish. If a lay person is doing, should be doing it, then a lay person should be doing it. Okay? My job is not to be father's little helper. I will help the best I can, but I am not a priest. I'm not supposed to be used just as substitutes. Okay, so this is, this is really a, a fine line to walk as we consider the assignment of deacons. We need to find a way to lower the age of the U.S. diaconate, and I think that includes recruiting efforts at a much younger age, targeting young, married, or young men at an earlier age. How do the Europeans do it? And the folks in Central and South America, the whole family comes to formation. And when, they sh when the family shows up at the door, there's a team of youth ministers who take those kids off and do age-appropriate activities while mom and dad are in class. But at prayer time and at meal time, the whole family's all together. It's a madhouse. It's beautiful. And that's how they do it. And several dioceses here in the United States are now experimenting with that same methodology. We have to revise diocesan policies to encourage younger vocations. Some bishops, not many anymore, used to have policies that said, if you've got a child under 18, we won't accept your application. Fortunately, we're moving around that. 
We need to get deacons out of the parish. Not completely. But we need to encourage our deacons to think outside the box, to think about the needs of the whole community, not just the needs of the parish. What are the things that aren't being done? What are the needs of the community that aren't being met? That's where the deacon can contribute. Not, oh, deacon, take over the sodality leadership. You've got people that can do that. Dual assignments works well. Giving a deacon a dual assignment works very, very well. And there are many opportunities for service at deanery, diocesan, national, and now even international service that deacons should be encouraged to look at. Deacons are not and should not be, in my opinion, parish employees, especially at the parish to which the, the, the bishop has assigned them. Think of that, a deacon parish, uh, a deacon uh, principal of a school. The school board and the pastor decide he's a great deacon but a lousy, a lousy principal. So you fire him. But he still holds an ecclesiastical assignment from the bishop. How many circles of hell have you just opened up? And what have you communicated to your parishioners? Who does the deacon ultimately work for? The bishop. The bishop. Formation should include community development initiatives. What are the needs of the overall community, not simply of the parish? And finally, the diaconate is not priesthood. And so we need to help convey the idea that we are there to help as much as we can, but we cannot and must not try to substitute for Father. That's not who we are. Last slide. 1949, a young, young guy was ordained a deacon, Deacon Thomas Merton. And he wrote in his journal that the first thing about the diaconate is that it is big. The more I think about it, the more I realize that it is a major order. You are supposed to be the strength of the church. You receive the Holy Spirit ad robur, not only for yourself, but to support the whole church. It's not a bad reflection for any of us, especially for those of us who are ordained as deacons. So thank you very much. And it's been a some conversation.